everyone, it's Haley, and today I'm going to be doing a bibliobabble for A Court of Wings and Rune by Sarah J. Mass. It is safe to say that I've been putting this video off because I know it's just going to suck so much to edit and film, so I've just been waiting, but I can't procrastinate any longer. I need to do it. So as per usual, I'll be starting off with the spoiler-free portion for this video, but as this is the third book of the A Court of Thorns and Roses series, it will only be spoiler-free as long as you have read these two books right here. So book number one, A Court of Thorns and Roses, and book number two, A Court of Mist and Fury. So as long as you have read these two, then you can stick around. But if you haven't gone and read them yet, I did a whole spoiler-free review for both of them. It was before I started Bibliobabbles, but I will link it down below anyways. They're really bad, but it'll still be there. I want to redo them, so hopefully soon. But as you guys probably know by now, her books take a lot out of me. So I'll give you a really brief summary. I don't generally like to summarize books that are sequels, but I'll give you a little bit to refresh your memory. So at the end of A Court of Mist and Fury, Feyre has been taken by Tamlin to the Spring Court. So this book picks up right where that one left off, where Feyre is trapped in Tamlin's disgustingly controlling grasp in the Spring Court. And all of Prithian seems to be falling apart and slowly approaching an inevitable war. So starting off with the writing, Sarah J Mass's writing is pretty much the same for all the books that she writes, which is really good. She has a clear voice and her battle scenes are one of my favorite things about her writing because they keep you on the edge of your seat the entire time. The action builds slowly and you're just immersed in the battle. She also is really the master of cliffhangers. Honestly, there's a cliffhanger at the end of like every chapter and at the end of every like small break in a chapter. It's just crazy how many cliffhangers hangers she's able to build in and kind of build that anticipation throughout this entire novel which is really what this book was doing was building anticipation and really just building it and building it and building it. And her books are interesting because they're not terribly quick reads but it's not necessarily the subject matter and the storyline that's not moving along quickly it's just it's kind of like an epic fantasy so it's really so many things are going on so many characters so many elements to the plot that you can't possibly just whiz through it. Now however with this one I did find that it was a little bit unnecessarily lengthy. It's about like 700 or something pages. Actually, I think it's almost 800. It is 699 pages, so it's 700 pages almost exactly. And it really doesn't need to be that long because like I said, it builds and builds and builds anticipation. So I found sometimes I felt like the storyline itself was going a little bit slow in terms of this one and I just didn't think that it needed to get longer. Like her books keep on getting longer and longer and a lot of the times it just feels like it's not necessary. Now her writing is always a tiny bit cheesy in terms of the romantic element to it. It's really like that traditional kind of classic paranormal romance and usually it doesn't bug me. It bugged me a little bit in this novel and she was really good at kind of cutting down on the possessive language in this novel and really thinking out the words that she was using. And the one thing that I like about her is if you're watching this I'm assuming that you've read the other two books because I told you that you had to have read them in order to watch this but you know that this is more on the mature side of YA so it features some sexual content and honestly the way that she writes her sex scenes doesn't bug me. I feel like it's not so cringy and inappropriate and like not inappropriate but sometimes sex scenes can be so cringy and you're like why? And sometimes they can be really abstract but I find that hers are written in a way that they're kind of enjoyable to read. Especially in this one I found that in A Court of Mist and Fury they were a little bit much at times especially because I found that there were so many of them. This book kind of puts the romance to the side in favor of a political aspect, but I'll talk more about that in the plot. Now I'm going to talk about the characters just briefly because I do want to focus on the plot, but Reese's characterization wasn't as strong. Also, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly because I don't remember how it's supposed to be pronounced, but that's how I'm gonna say it, so I'm sticking to it. But I just felt like he wasn't as prevalent of a character as he was in A Court of Mist and Fury, if that kind of makes sense. I did still like him, but I felt like he didn't play as much of a role, which I didn't really mind because this book really focused on the females. So he really kind of became my least favorite favorite out of the side characters, if you will. I did really like his relationship with Feyre. His protectiveness isn't an unhealthy thing. It's not like he's like, I need to constantly protect you and be with you and like, you can't stand without me. It's more so, I want to support you and be there for you when you need me. So he encourages her to do stuff on her own, to be her own person, and I liked that about him. Now Feyre, you do really see coming into her own. I feel like she has a great character arc from the first book to this book. She becomes a complete 
completely different person, but she still is at her core the person that she was as a human in that first novel. And I think that's a real strength of Sarah J Maas is changing that character, but not so much that she's unrecognizable. She just is kind of a more powerful version of herself. As a human, she had power because she really cared for her family and she wasn't afraid to do anything to help them. But as a Fae, she actually has powers and you see her doing the same things that she would have done in that first novel and for the same reasons, but with her newfound Fae abilities. Newfound as in the last novel, but like you get the point. Now she has been through a lot as a character and really Sarah J Maas's characters always have some heartbreaking backstory and that's kind of what makes them interesting is the fact that they all have a backstory. In Feyre we followed that story throughout all three of these novels and you see her healing in this book but she never really heals completely. She always has that little part of her that will be affected by the things that she has seen and the experiences that she has had but that kind of fuels her and she uses it to prevent others from having to experience what she did. And she's really able to bring that empathy that's really inherent in her nature into her Fey character and use it to help others. So as much as she's overcome everything that's happened to her, it's made her a better person and she has been able to use it to fuel her. Now what really stood out to me in this book was the entire group of characters. One of my favorite scenes is a really simple scene where it's just a group of characters and that's it and it was just a great scene and I'll talk about it more in the spoiler portion. It's not really spoilery but I still don't want to say it just in case. But it was just a very simple scene that really showed these characters and how strong their characterizations were. And another reason why I don't want to talk too too much about the characters is once again for spoilers sake. But what I will say is that there's a couple of characters in this book that were kind of prevalent before but only by association and in this book they really came into their own and became some of my favorite favorite characters. But once again I'll talk about that more in the spoiler portion. So now getting into the plot and the nitty gritty of this, I did not reread these two books before I read this one because I knew this was going to take me forever to read as it was and those ones took me forever to read so I just didn't really feel like rereading them. So I was kind of constantly referring to the wiki page which was so helpful for me because I forget a lot of things after I read books. It happens all the time. I have a terrible memory and especially with books like this where there's so many things going on and so many little aspects that I have trouble picking up on as it is. I do think that there could have been a little bit more done in way of kind of like refreshing readers from what happened in the other novel, but that might just be personal preference. Now like I mentioned, this book was really slow. It featured a lot of politics and planning and it wasn't so much action heavy. It did become action heavy at points, like the last 100 pages of this book will just blow you away, but throughout a lot of it, it kind of felt like you were plotting toward this big finale that you were like, when the hell are we gonna get there? But then when you did it was totally worth it but while you were reading it it was kind of like okay I understand that all this stuff is gonna happen like enough with the planning let's just do it. But one of my absolute favorite things about this book is that it's a lovely book ending to the series. You can just really see elements of the first book coming into this book and I thought that was just awesome. I just love when books are able to come full circle and kind of bring those elements of the first one into the last book even though the characters have changed, it helps you to kind of see how they have changed. Now one thing that I wasn't expecting was that this book was a little bit predictable for me. At times there were things that would happen and it would be like this big like, oh my god, how did that happen? And I was like, how did you not see that coming? So I'm not one to usually guess what's going to happen in a book, but I did find sometimes I was like, this is obviously gonna happen. Why are you acting like it's not? Like it's literally right there for you. So that was kind of weird for me, especially because I find Sarah J Mass books a lot of the time kind of just keep you on the edge of your seat and keep you guessing and a lot of the times for this one I was kind of like yep that's obvious but at the end like the last 200 or so pages I would say I was like oh did not see that coming but like the rest of it I was kind of like yeah obviously. Now the group antics were another one of my favorite things about this book. I felt like they really came through and were shining through the whole book. It really reminded me of Lee Bardugo because one of my favorite things is like the banter between her characters and how it seems so realistic and 
everything that you want to be. You want to be that witty. And I found that coming through with the group in this book as well, which was awesome. An interesting thing about this book was the kind of musings on the power balances between male and female in relationships, especially as males and females who are in a leading role in society, particularly between Feyre and Reese. And I kind of talked about this a little bit, but I just liked the fact that as females were gaining power, it wasn't the males that were kind of guiding them that way or they weren't leaning on the males. It was really the females standing on their own. And like I said, this book really was female driven. It was very empowering for females and I liked that a lot. I liked the fact that the females were kind of taking back their autonomy and power and you saw them in positions of power, which they have been in the previous two books, but I felt like in this one it really just came through. Now, the one thing with the ending is if you're expecting everything to be tied up in a pretty little package, you're not going to get that. Now, I do know that this is not the last book in the Court of Thorns and Roses series, but it is the last one told from Feyre's perspective. And as such, I was kind of hoping for a little bit more closure for her story. I'm happy it's over and I felt like it ended at a good point. Like I'm sad it's over also, but I just felt like it ended at a really good point. But at the same time, I didn't really get that satisfying ending for her that I had wanted. Now, emotions become a really huge part in this story. It's kind of like, honestly, sometimes it felt like it was like a therapy session. Like, how does that make you feel? How do you feel? But everyone was sharing their emotions and they're never really kind of under the surface. So you're never really left to guess that. So there was kind of more telling than showing in that, which sometimes was a little bit much. And just getting back to the group dynamic, I think what makes this group so strong is the fact that while they're all different in their own right, they all kind of have this connection of wanting to heal, but none of them can really fully heal. So they try to do what they can to heal others and keep them from feeling the pain that they have felt. And I think that's awesome. And where the group really came to shine was the fact that none of the side characters were pushed to the side and you didn't really get to know about them. You felt like you didn't know them. All of them were characters that were strong in their own right. Now, what I found this book did was it kind of mimicked the epic fantasy tropes, but it didn't in a different way because you didn't really get that epic fantasy ending in a way. I will say I did find the ending scene to be really intelligent, so I liked that scene a lot. So that's all I'm going to say as far as spoiler free stuff because this is a really easy book to spoil without meaning to. So if you're like me and you have put off reading this book forever, then go and read it now. Just go and do it. You won't regret it. And then come back so we can discuss it. But if you are unlike me and you have already read this book probably months ago, then stay so we can talk about it. <laughs> So the beginning of this book was really interesting for reasons. I'm gonna put this down because it's an extremely heavy book. Like normally I would just hold it, but let's like dagger them. Oh yeah, look at that aesthetic right there. So the beginning of this book was interesting because it was kind of turning Feyre's character on her head and you saw kind of her antics come out. She is the villain in the beginning and I thought that was very interesting. You see her intelligence as that villain character and how great of a villain she would make because she has such strategic maneuvering around the spring court and using this really unfortunate situation of being back in the hands of her captor to her advantage and making sure that it's not time that's going to waste. So in the beginning, Jurian and Ianth and everyone else, they come to visit the spring court and the cauldron, there's this whole scene where the cauldron chooses Feyre instead of Ianth and she's known as like the curse breaker. It's this whole thing, but really she's just using her powers to make this happen. I was kind of confused a little bit in the writing of that scene but I did eventually get it that like she was doing it and there's a really great line after that happened where they was like I looked at I am and I smiled again and I let a little bit of wolf show like I just thought it really showed how she is not backing down and she is becoming a powerful character and she is just standing up to those who have suppressed her in the past. Now Reese and Feyre have been kind of talking through the bond just checking in with each other making sure that everything is okay because Reese is with Nesta and Elaine and obviously Feyre is in the spring court but one of my favorite things was this line after they had been talking through the bond it is beautiful and this is one of the things that I love about Sarah J Mass's writing is her ability to convey emotions using word like it's just amazing so it goes the stars winked into existence dim and small above the blazing fires I watched them through the long hours of celebrating and could have sworn that they kept me company my silent and stalwart friend.
friends. What a beautiful line is that? Like, I just thought it was amazing that, like, she had just been talking to Reese, and Reese is in the night court, obviously, and she looks up at the stars, and she feels like he's with them, and, like, that really the night court is with her, standing by her, even though she's in the spring court. Like, I was just like, girl, that is beautiful. But anyways, Lucian really starts to play a big role in this book, and Lucian is a character that I always just felt for. He was always a character that I liked, even though he kind of is always by Tamlin and like standing by Tamlin, but I just felt like he had no other choice and he just didn't know what else to do. And you kind of do start to see that in this book, that Lucian just doesn't really know what to do if he's not with Tamlin. He's been with him forever, so he just feels like his loyalties lie there. And you find out that Tamlin has sent Lucian to perform the right instead, and like, I just can't stand Tamlin because he is such a controlling and abusive man and I just can't do it. Now Lucian and Feyre are together and they see these mortals and Feyre goes into their minds to try and convince them to flee for the continent and then they find their bodies soon after. And you find out that Brana and Dagden have been hunting mortals, which is just absolutely sickening. So then I love the fact that she sets the, I don't know how to pronounce this, bogey? Boge? Boga? I, boga? What? I don't know. But she sets that on them and it was amazing. Now another really great line is Jurian. They're really just kind of expecting Feyre to be kind of just this subdued, like, you do whatever, I'm fine, blah blah blah. Like, Tamlin's the real leader here, I'm just a meek female, so like, whatever. But she obviously isn't that and she's standing up to them and giving her opinion on things. And Jurian is like, maybe Rysand, the most powerful high lord in the world, hasn't lost his mate. He's unleashed her upon us. And I thought that was just an amazing amazing line because it really fits. Because Feyre really has become just this force of nature that no one can really contend with because she has the wit and she has the strength and the power and the emotional will and that's really what drives her character. Now I felt for Feyre when the plans that she would orchestrate went wrong and she couldn't save everyone. For example when the guard got whipped and she just can't always save everyone so it's kind of that like utilitarian thing where she wants to create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And I think that's a situation and a decision that she really struggles with. But after that, you see the fact that Feyre does try and get revenge whenever she can. So Lucian has been being taken advantage of by Ianth again, and Feyre enters, and she enters Ianth's mind and makes her, like, beat her hand with the stone, which I was, like, cringing that entire scene. I just could not handle it. I was like, oh my god, that's nasty. But at the same time, I was like, yes, you go, girl. So it was very conflicted emotions. And we find out that Brana and Dagdan have been taking their magic and draining it from them. And it kind of puts this wrench in her whole plan because she's been relying on her magic, but she kind of has to go back to the basics from when she was a human and learn to survive and fight without her magic. So I like the fact that Feyre didn't flee on her own. She left with Lucian, and I know that wasn't her original plan, but I like the fact that she was like she let him come along. Now, the reuniting between Feyre and Reese was a lot for me. It started off all cute and stuff and then of course in the end it turned sexual which like I was obviously expecting. I mean I read A Court of Mist and Fury but I was still like ugh. Now this is when we first see the new Nesta and Elaine as their fae and you see Nesta's rage and Elaine's silence. So they're kind of like polar opposites in that sense. And you see that there's this bond between Cassian and Nesta and Cassian is probably my favorite male character like he actually is. I love him because he's so sarcastic and amazing. But one thing, when I was reading this book, I could not help but get Twilight vibes. I just couldn't. Like the, I think it was called imprinting, but like the thing that happens with Jacob to what's her name? The baby. But the imprinting, that like kind of felt like the mating bond to me. And there were just so many things that I was like, am I reading Twilight? But like a better version, but it was weird. Moore really became one of my favorite characters in this book because she was hilarious. And you see Nesta finally comes out and more whispers to Feyre, I think we're going to need a lot more wine. Which just it was hilarious. And then I forget when, I think it happens soon after, but Nesta ends up kind of ripping Feyre a new one and more just slams the bottle of wine down on the table in front of Feyre after Nesta leaves. But then she slam when she slams a bottle of wine down, it makes it even better. She's like, it's fine if you drink directly from it, which is how I feel sometimes. It was just amazing. But I felt like Nesta's fey form was kind of amplifying the traits that were always there in her as a human. So she just became
became kind of more of a really difficult person but still having that compassion kind of underlying that you never really get to see. I really think she's a character that has just always worn the suit of armor and I think that her becoming Faye really strengthened that armor. I liked the relationship between Nesta and Amran because Amran is a character that people are way too afraid to approach and Nesta's just not afraid of anything so she is just like going at her which I just loved because they're both kind of tough characters and the friendship just kind of made sense. Now one of my favorite parts was at about I think it was page 180 or something like that but it was just all of them were sitting around the table having a conversation at dinner and I just felt like that was the most pure moment in the book because there's this war that's inevitably coming but they're just sitting there and having a conversation at dinner and you get to see their relationship and it was just I don't know why but I just loved that moment. Now there's many times in this book where you kind of see Feyre expecting Reese to do the things that Tamlin did like she's expecting him to forbid her from doing things and you see Reese is like I'm not gonna do that because like I don't have control over you you're your own person he made her high lady and everything so she's the first high lady and she is a strong independent female who don't need no man and it's amazing now I loved seeing the library the library was amazing it's like carved into the base of a mountain I was like literally like why can't this actually exist I wanted it so badly and then there's this pit in the middle and I just felt like that whole thing was gonna come into play a lot later I just knew it but there's these women who are priestesses in the library and Reese has offered the library a sanctuary to them so it's really him offering his protection because they've all had terrible things happen to them for example the one girl is Clotho and this was literally like Shakespearean because it reminded me so much of Titus Andronicus because in Titus Andronicus there's the character Lavinia and Lavinia has been raped by two men and they have cut out her tongue and they chopped off her hands so then she can't tell anyone what has happened to her and she can't write it down either so she can't possibly communicate her assailants and the same thing has happened to Clotho except they smashed her hands so I thought that was very interesting to bring into it and it just offered a very vivid image and it shows how Reese cares for people the fact that he wants to especially women and he wants to take these women and protect them from those that have hurt them so I liked that it was this refuge kind of for females who had endured and survived it just made sense why he would be so intrigued by Feyre and want to help her and really that comes through I think in his affection for her. Now there are things that bug me about him though because like there's the one part where Feyre has a nightmare and he's like do you want to tell me about it and then she tells him and then his response is to kiss her like that doesn't fix anything sir speak. And another really weird thing that bugged me was at around page 250 Feyre goes into Lucian's mind as he is looking at at Elaine and there were so many formatting inconsistencies I felt like with that whole paragraph because like the part where it's supposed to be in his mind is supposed to be italics but it felt like some parts were not in his mind but they were still italicized it was very weird another thing that I hate about Reese and Feyre's relationship like I don't hate it all I do like it but I just can't stand the fact that she always refers to him as my mate I'm like Ugh. now Reese I feel like is put in a very difficult position of wanting to protect his friends but also needing to protect the greater population population and that really comes out when he blindsides more with Eris and Kier. I'm probably saying all of that wrong but you see how he has to make these difficult decisions and he really doesn't know what to do. Now in this book you find out the truth about Amran's escape and the fact that she had to bind herself to a mortal. If she was unbound she would actually forget them and not remember anything and she was like a great powerful being who existed before even Prithian did and you just know that's gonna come into play. But Elaine also you get to see more of her and she, she starts nonsense sensically rambling instead of just sitting there in silence and I felt like she would become key and I was right obviously but I literally wrote down oracle figure question mark and then they find out soon after that she's a seer which just makes sense. Now Nesta and Feyre are in the library and they go into the pit because they're being chased by Hybern's crones and she ends up setting the thing that's in the pit on them without even looking at it and I like the fact that they were able to do that on their own. They weren't able to signal Reese that anything was happening but they didn't need a man to come and save them. Cassian and Reese just came to kind of assist after, not really rescue them, but to offer kind of a supporting hand. Now Lucian leaves for the human lands, which like was fine and it did come into play, but I was kind of like sad about that because I really like Lucian and I wanted him to be there and become a part of the main crew, but whatevs. Now we find out that Highburn has attacked the summer court, so then they call this meeting and all of the high lords come and everyone's like, oh Tamlin hasn't been to a meeting in forever. He's not going to show 
up and I was like okay he's gonna show up because he's gonna know that Feyre is gonna be there and if Feyre is not there Reese is gonna be there so like obviously he's gonna be there and then he shows up and they're all like oh how why are you here I was like obviously he was going to come he knows she's gonna be there like come on but you see how he treats her as a female like as lesser and really all of them to an extent are kind of doing that except for Reese and he starts just running his mouth and like being very dismissive of her and Reese really just shows his power but he does it in the most magnificent way because he makes it so he can't speak anymore and I was like yes yeah, someone shut that bitch up I loved it now my favorite part about this book and I didn't really want to mention this in the spoiler free section because I felt like it was kind of a spoiler but I loved how the sisters are brought into the story that's where I felt like it really book ended was the fact that the first book is really about her trying to protect her sisters and her family and that's how she got into this whole mess in the first place and then the last book really brings that back is that the sisters play a key role they come into the story and she still wants to protect them but they're able to stand on their own and she's able to support them and that final battle scene when we get the carver and the weaver and the bryaxis I can't say that at all but I felt like the three of them were kind of mirroring Feyre, Elaine, and Nesta because they just were kind of that changing force in the war in that battle and then Nesta and Elaine and Feyre end up being the changing force in the battle so it's kind of like the two of them working together as this trio of badassery and I'm kind of skipping ahead but I love the fact that Feyre was able to gather the three of them and then unleash them and kind of change the course of the war using that and then her father comes in which came out of nowhere and then we've got the lost queen who comes in and then Amryn like sets this trap and you think she's lying which was a major plot twist for me I was very confused because you think that she's going to use the cauldron and use the book to help Feyre but then she ends up using it to unbind herself and unleash her true form and she does that to change the course of everything so all of these elements kind of combine for them rising up against Highburn and the opposing forces but the main thing that I love and I loved it so much was on page 653 when Elaine friggin stabs Highburn which came out of nowhere because she has always been kind of like subdued and she is just like Neh, and is like don't you dare touch my sister because she has Nesta it was ridiculous I was like I literally took the book and was like what I loved it so much honestly there are just so many elements of the story that I felt like came together in an interesting way but I just felt like it took so long for them to actually come together and that very overwhelming for me so when they finally did I was like woo. but like as a whole I felt like there were so many politics going into it that I was like dear god what there were lots of interesting twists and turns though for example like Jurian not actually being an enemy he was very confusing character for me but where the book's strengths really lie I think is in the fact that I was able to come full circle and bring those sister characters to the forefront so that is all for today's Biblio Babble for A Court of Wings and Rune by Sarah J Mass I hope you guys enjoyed don't forget to subscribe I put out new Biblio Babbles every Wednesday as well as unboxings on Wednesdays main videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays and reading vlogs on Mondays and don't forget to follow me on Twitter my Twitter is at Hills and Bookland and my Instagram is at Haley and Bookland but all that information is down below for you guys so thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video bye